Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 60 of the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This week, we're going to be finishing up pulmonology. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm the host and creator here at Physician Assistant Exam Review, uh, com, where you can find all of the notes, everything you want over on the website, www.physicianassistantexamreview.com, where we cover the entire uh, PA blueprint, pants, penry uh, review <laughs> blueprints all over there. So if you're having trouble finding anything, certainly go over there. There's a search box you can find. I just moved all of the menus to the bottom of the page. So if you're struggling to find that stuff, it should be down there. Um, and there's a search box. You can put in anything you want and it will pop right up. This week we're going to be finishing pulmonology, uh, just rounding out the other section for the blueprint uh, at the end. They always throw in a couple of things that just sort of don't fit into the rest of the category. So we're going to be doing those today and finishing this up. next. In the next session, I think we're going to be doing uh, ENT. I think we're going to jump into that next. Um, I think that's about it to get started with. So let's go ahead and jump right in to our priming questions. Where are the three most common precipitating factors for acute respiratory distress? And I'm sorry, what are the three most common precipitating factors for the, for acute respiratory distress syndrome? What are the three most common precipitating factors for acute respiratory distress syndrome? Ooh, I almost gave them away like I did a couple weeks ago. Secondary to preeclampsia, you must induce delivery at 36 weeks gestation. Are prophylactic steroids recommended prior to delivery? Secondary to preeclampsia, you must induce delivery at 36 weeks gestation. Are prophylactic steroids recommended prior to delivery? And we'll get into all that in just a second here as we round out pulmonology. So here we go. Uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is a severe inflammation of the lung tissue, which impairs gas exchange secondary to acute injury which then causes some pulmonary edema. The capillaries get leaky and oxygen does not transfer within the lungs. Without treatment, it's upwards of 90% of patients will die. This is a really, really horrible state to be in. With treatment, I think the number is like 40%. And generally speaking, uh, the people... When you have somebody with ARDS, they're in rough shape to begin with or something else, something causing this situation, uh, and that's part of the problem, but certainly the, the poor exchange of oxygen is a huge factor. So associated with the onset of ARDS are three major, uh, I'm sorry, the majority of ARDS cases are seen in these three settings. The first one is sepsis, so that's number one overall. Clearly, sepsis is the, the biggest precipitating factor for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Severe trauma, so multiple traumas, and then aspiration of gastric contents. So we're talking about severe trauma and severe trauma to the lungs in particular uh, will lead into acute respiratory distress syndrome. I think those three account for like 75 or 80% of cases, but certainly there are lots of other possibilities that can cause this. So things like near drowning, inhalation of toxins, shock, burns, uh, you can get it in pancreatitis. You can get it if you have disseminated intravascular coagulation, so DIC or thrombocytic uh, thrombocytopenia. Obviously, those patients are in rough shape to begin with, so this is a, is a bad, bad situation. You can get it with uh, severe pneumonia, miliary, miliary tuberculosis, lung conditions, or high-altitude exposure, and I'm sure there are others that aren't on this list, but it's just the, the list itself is kind of important, but it's the understanding of the types of severity of the injury to the lungs, that we're talking about that can bring this on and where kind of, what kind of patients you'll see this in. Uh, this isn't someone who's going to walk into your office uh, with a cough. That's, that's not the way that this works. This is somebody who's hospitalized for something else. Um, like I said, either in your drowning, they have severe trauma, they have sepsis, right? They're not walking into your office with sepsis. They're, they're severely sick in the hospitals, the, the kind of setting where you're going to see this. So for our clinical presentation, again, this, is, this isn't somebody walking into your office, this is, but it is going to be onset within 12 to 24 hours of the initiating cause. The patients are going to have acute dyspnea and acute tech, uh, tachypnea. They can have frothy red sputum, which I think is a good one to highlight in your notes. They'll have diffuse crackles, because if you think about it, 
one thing that I try to keep in mind and separate out and I think of as, as sort of key terms are things like th that term diffuse crackle. So what is going to give you crackles throughout the entire lung fields? Well, ARDS is certainly something that will. You know, when you talk about pneumonia, you're talking about a, uh, a solid, sort of that solid mass in the lungs, that, that fluid buildup, right? But it's usually in one area. For ARDS, it's going to be diffuse. So I try to keep those things separate in my head. The other big one here is they have hypoxia, hypoxemia that does not respond to oxygen. So you're talking about low uh, O2 sats, and you give these people oxygen, but the O2 sats really don't come up. And again, if you think about the cause of all this, it's because you're not getting the oxygen to transfer in the lungs into the capillaries, so you're not getting that oxygen exchange. So no matter what you give them for oxygen, they're going to have trouble still raising their O2 sats. So it's hypoxemia that does not respond to oxygen. And again, that's another one I would, I would highlight because I'm not sure a whole lot of other places where that comes up. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any. I'm sure somebody will find one and, and just <laughs> tell me that there is something out there. And, and there probably is, um, but it's few and far between. So that's something I would definitely hold on to as far as ARDS goes. Chest x-ray can be normal, especially early on. And then you wind up with bilateral opacities with no other good explanations for them. The treatment here is really going to be two, it's going to be two mainstays of treatment. One is going to be treat the underlying cause. So we're going to deal with the issue. So if it's something like sepsis, obviously, we're going to try and deal with that because without dealing with the sepsis, uh, taking working on the ARDS is not going to solve the problem. The ARDS itself, though, how you treat that is really going to wind up being intubation and mechanical ventilation especially with people whose O2 sats are below 90. So you're going to intubate and ventilate them. Our next one for today is hyaline membrane disease or respiratory distress syndrome. This occurs in premature infants due to insufficient production of surfactant. And this one, I don't know, I just always held on to this one. I didn't think this was a tough one to remember. It just sort of stands out. It's easy to picture. These little babies have tachypnea, tachycardia. They have muscular retractions, nasal flaring and they can have apnea. Labs and studies, the chest x-ray has decreased lung volumes. And here's the big one, diffuse atelectasis giving a ground glass appearance. Right, because if you remember, surfactant is the stuff that makes it so that the, the lungs expand and don't stick together inside. Because as the alveoli collapse and expand when you breathe in, without the surfactant, those alveoli stick or get kind of stuck and they won't open up and allow the oxygen and the air to come in so you get that atelectasis and ground glass appearance on chest x-ray. Treatment is the, uh, we're going to start off with prevention here. So steroids are given if there is a risk of delivery before 34 weeks gestation. Before 34 weeks gestation. And the treatment, if you don't manage to get uh, prevention, is going to be oxygen, positive airway pressures, Right, because you kind of, kind of have to push those alveoli open. And you may need to intubate these patients. And there is a surfactant spray that can help. And then our last one for the day, and this will round us out for pulmonology, is foreign body aspiration, which is relatively straightforward. I think that's a, of all the things to wrap your head around, this one's pretty, pretty easy. It's more frequent in children and in, and in the elderly. So maybe in kids, you're talking about crayons, and in the elderly, you're talking about food or steak. Clinical presentation is wheezing, drooling, dyspnea, or foul smell. That was always one that stood out for me, um, and the idea being that something that, that's not an immediate response. That's after something gets stuck in there for a couple of days. Lab studies and physical exam findings, the chest x-ray may show air trapping if you get a, uh, a valve situation. So you get something gets aspirated, and you breathe it into your lungs, and it clogs the tube, right? But that will allow air sometimes, the way that that's set up, we've talked about this before, um, although it gets stuck in there, when you take a deep breath, it allows the air to come in, but then as you go to breathe out, that object falls back into place and closes off the, the tubes going out, right? So you can breathe in, but not out, so you get that air trapping over time, it builds and builds. Treatment, 
Treatment here is pretty straightforward. It's removal of the foreign body under anesthesia if necessary. So you go in and get it out. Obviously, the Heimlich maneuver is another good one if you're talking about uh, something stuck in the upper upper airways. And that's it. That'll round out um, pulmonology for us. And that will wrap up that 10% of the material. Again, you can get all the notes over at www.physicianassistantexamreview.com. You can find them right on the, on the web pages. You can go back through all of the uh, podcast episodes there. Oh, something else that I have over there now that I just put up this week um, is if you go over to the website and go to any of the pulmonology pages, you will find a, uh, there should be a, uh, a button there or a pop-up or something that will make it so that you can get access to the first 40 questions from the final step from the book that I wrote with all the questions. Um, and that'll be over there on the website. You can just go over to the website and check that out. Or if you prefer, if it's easier, uh, if, if you're uh, not sitting in front of a computer often, um, you can, I set up a text messaging system so that you can get it that way as well. So you can get it by texting. If you text the number 33444, that's 33444, and you, and you text the word breathing, B-R-E-A-T-H-I-N-G, that'll set you up with that same uh, 40 questions from the pulmonology section chapter of the final step. So that's totally um, helpful, something that I think you'll get a lot of use out of. So you can either go over to the website or just text breathing to 33444 and that'll get you those questions. Um, let's go on to our study tip for today. Our study tip for today is going to be set the stage. And what I mean by this is it's hard to, to picture this if you, if you don't stop and look around a little bit. But where your brain relies on a lot of different cues throughout the day to either cycle up or cycle down or to focus and concentrate, or to sort of procrastinate and veg out. There's a lot of different cues you get from your environment. So, for example, I talk about before you go to bed, setting up a um, sleep habits. Uh, I forget what the, <laughs> I'm struggling to come up with the name of it at the moment. Um, but it falls under the, the, the umbrella of sleep hygiene. And you set up a routine before you go to bed that sort of powers down your brain and tells your brain it's time to shut off. So you brush your teeth, you wash your face. Um, for me, I turn the fan on because I like the noise. Um, but there's a whole system that you can go through, four or five things, they don't have to be long, that sort of cue your brain into the idea that it's time to go to bed. I try to explain this to my kids because my one just bounces around and is shooting baskets and then he can't fall asleep and he wonders why. And I try to explain to him that it's a time to be cycling down, to be shutting down. You know, you start to dim the lights, you start to Maybe you read a little bit, something that gets your brain into the idea that it's time to settle down and go to bed. Well, the same thing, the same cues or similar cues you can use when it's time to study, when it's time to get to work, to focus your brain and, and rather, because as you know, it doesn't really work just to say, hey, it's time to study. And then all of a sudden you're off thinking about other things, but you can set up these cues for your brain that tell it it's time to get to work. So I use specific music. I use uh, Focus at Will, which I talk about from time to time, which really helps me uh, focus in. Another thing I do is before I get started, I clear my desk of everything that's going on. Some people will light a candle before they get started. Or I set timers before I get started. There are a lot of different things you can do to get your brain to understand that, okay, the rest of the world's getting blocked out and I'm getting to work on this. And that will really help you cut down on the the thought streams that break into your studying and keep you focused on the work at hand and really let your brain cue into the fact that it's time to get to work. It's time to study. Um, you'd be surprised how helpful those things can be, especially if you set up the same routine every time. That's really the biggest key. Um, if you do it in the same fashion, in the same way, it'll make that, it'll have the biggest impact. Anything will help. But if you have like a list, what I tend to do is have a list of four or five things I do uh, so, for example, right before I start the podcast, I have a list of about four or five things I do to sort of get my mind set on how I'm going to go through this, on my energy level, on how I'm going to be, and what I'm going to be thinking about and focused on so my mind isn't wandering as I'm doing this. And that makes a huge, huge difference. So I strongly recommend you work on setting up a system for setting the stage to get your brain on board with whatever it is you're doing. All right, great. Let's wrap up with the answers to our priming questions. What are the three most common precipitating factors for acute respiratory distress syndrome? What are the three most common precipitating factors for acute respiratory distress syndrome? 
remember we talked about sepsis being number one, severe trauma, and aspiration of gastric contents. Secondary to preeclampsia, you must induce delivery at 36 weeks gestation. Are prophylactic steroids recommended prior to delivery? Secondary to preeclampsia, you must induce delivery at 36 weeks gestation. Are prophylactic steroids recommended prior to delivery? And the answer is no, only because it's at it's before 34 weeks. That's the magic number. So if you're going to if a baby's going to have to be born before 34 weeks, you're going to want to give steroids to increase the level of surfactant that is being produced in their lungs and thereby reduce the chances of them getting highly highly membrane disease. I hope that's clear. I hope that all makes sense. Um, that'll wrap us up again for this week and for pulmonology in general. Uh, I'm super excited about all the people who have been reaching out to me lately about passing their exams. Definitely let me know when that happens. It's always, uh, keeps me going, keeps me interested in doing this. So please keep, keep up with that. Again, if you head over to the website, you can get the pulmonary questions on any of the pulmonology pages. Uh, definitely go check that out. I think it's, it's, you'll be, uh, It'll be super helpful. So go do- definitely go take a look at that. And I think that'll take us out for this week. So we will talk to you again soon. Thanks. Take care.